Okay. So um, today we discuss. Uh, we are going to discuss the uh, integration technology that uh, is called the REST and uh, it is built on top of HTTP. So while last time we discussed HTTP basically as a way, as a means for developing and supporting web applications and uh, user interaction through web applications, today we discuss uh, how to use HTTP, how to build on top of HTTP at, uh, an architecture for collaborating between different software components. Okay? This uh, is called the REST, it's a strange name, but uh, uh, it's the, the representation of a state uh, actually is the philosophy, the, the general idea behind uh, this kind of uh, approach. Uh, by the way, we, uh, we will not find any specific standard or definition or RFC or whatever about uh, REST. Uh, I, I updated, I, I see you're looking, I updated these slides uh, yesterday, so if you have printed it then for last, since last week, uh, the, this part has been changed. Um, so, uh, because uh, REST is not a standard like HTTP, HTTP where you can find all the definition. It's a, a sort of design pattern, a design architecture. So a set of criteria that guide you to develop uh, application. So there is no strict rules. Mm -hmm. We try to follow some guidelines uh, that were uh, firstly defined by this uh, Roy Fielding. Roy Fielding was one of the designers of this of the standardization of the HTTP 1.1 protocol, and uh, in his PhD uh, dissertation, uh, in, the, in his thesis of the PhD that he did, uh, uh, he developed uh, the idea of this REST. This something that goes back to, to, the, ne to the 90s. Hmm? Uh, but very recently, it, has ga it gained a lot of attention, a lot of interest. Uh, it's a style of software architecture. It's totally platform independent. It's totally language independent. So it's a way of letting uh, applications that uh, are developed on different languages on, run on different platforms to exchange data and services using uh, the web standard technologies, uh, for example, HTTP. And since it uses HTTP, it reuses the same infrastructure of the World Wide Web, and so it's extremely likely that an HTTP call will be able to go through all the levels of firewalls and uh, routers and proxy and so on. It's something that can work uh, through the infrastructure compared to other protocols that maybe are blocked at the firewall level or at the router level or at the proxy level. Uh, see, we are running on top of HTTP. HTTP runs everywhere because otherwise you are blocking the web to the people. So you're building something on top of a, of a protocol that is sort of guaranteed to work always. Uh, the basic uh, idea of the REST architecture is uh, to think and to express about resources. So we, we, we need to express, to describe huh, our application, our system, in terms of a set of resources. A resource can be one document, can be one object, in obvious oriented speaking, can be one service, can be a collection of other objects or other resources, or so on. Or it can be a representation of some information. For example, I don't know if we are in this classroom, there are students, uh, each, the classroom is a resource, each student is a resource, the, col the collection of students in this classroom is a resource, and so on. So it's a, a generic concept. Uh, it's a mapping to an entity, so map a name, a concept to an entity or to a set or collection of an entity. Uh, of course, this set of entities can change over time. So the resource describing the students in this classroom is a resource whose contents is changing over time as people come and go. But the conceptual resource is still the same. Students in this classroom. That is built on top of the resource of students and the resource classroom. 
so the idea is that we try to identify the resources in our web application or in our application distributed application that we need that need to be shared with other applications and we map every resource to a unique uh, address uri hmm? uh, and so we can use uris to describe not web pages but resources abstract resources an natural resource uh, okay it's useful to describe and <laughs> to discuss but uh, actually needs a concrete representation so what does it need what does it mean that i have a resource uh, describing the set of students in this classroom i can also describe a uri http polito.it slash classroom slash 3i slash students we will describe URIs that tell no, uh, what the resource is. But then I know that this strange URI represents uh, a set of students, abstractly. But concretely, uh, concretely, I need to have one representation of the list of students in some format. It may be as a text file or a set of uh, um, numbers of uh, uh, enrollment matricula or it can be uh, an xml file encoding the information about the students in the classroom it can be encoded in many other ways uh, the idea is that a resource is a abstract concept but to exchange information about the resource we need the concrete representation concrete representation of the current value of the resource so we explain the rest word representational state state is the current state of the resource we are talking about resources but we are interested in the current value of this resource of course there are some values that will never change your name first name and last name will never change so that resource is for the state is constant over time but other resources have a state that can change the list of students here hmm? the list of courses every year changes for example and so we are interested of to uh, know to be able to read and write and modify the current state the current value of a given resource in a representational way so we exchange representations of that state the state is an abstract stuff the set of people the set, a set is a mathematical object but this set is represented into a specific format so rest is about talking about the state of a resource a way to represent it in a concrete format and a way to use to exchange these concrete formats to read and write so to know and to modify the state of the resources themselves and how do we modify or read or access the state of a resource we do through the basic methods of the http protocol so if a, if a resource is uh, mapped to a uri behind that resource there is a representation for example in xml or we will uh, work more with the JSON format, which is easier. But imagine a text representation of a resource. And if I want to know what is the current value, the current state of that resource, I can try to do a get operation onto the URI that represents the, the abstract resource. And what I get is the re representation in some format of the current state of the resource. And if I want to modify that resource, well, I can do a post or a put or a delete, which are the methods of HTTP that modify some content. So we are actually uh, using these three ingredients, mapping, talking about resources that have a state on the abstract level. Resources are mapped to a URI, state is mapped to a representation, and the representation is exchanged and modified by means of HTTP methods. These are the three main ideas about REST. 
And so these resources usually, if we try to simplify, are mainly of two different categories. Resources that represent a single item, an element, or resources that represent a collection of items. So for example, this could be a URI that represents the collection of all the students of Polytechnico. This could be a, a URI that represents uh, the collection of all the courses of Polytechnico. Okay, it represents, it's a mapping. Hmm? And uh, uh, the format usually of a, a collection resource uh, is uh, Uh, sorry, is slash resource. So we, of course, we have a server component slash the type of resource we are seeking. A collection. All the students, all the courses. And then if I, then talking about a single a specific student or a specific course, I could append no, to the URI an identifier, some string, that identifies uniquely that specific item inside the larger collection. So students slash number of enrollment, or courses slash code of the course, and so on. And that represents the course or represents that guy with that enrollment number. Okay? Then the operations, so these are just representations, mappings. What can we do with these names? Well, we can try to get or modify the information that is associated to this. Uh, for clarity, the guidelines said that uh, it's better to describe resources by using always nouns in the plural form. So that's why we use students' uh, courses and not students' course. Just to remind that it's a collection of names. And this is one item of one collection. Hmm? And try to be as specific as possible, slash course. The idea behind the rest is that by Looking at the URI, a developer can understand what happens there. What is the information that they can get or they can modify? So the URIs should be able to speak by themselves, theoretically. If you can map in your mind the concept behind the resources, then you can quite naturally understand how to represent them. That's the, the goal. Hmm? Uh, okay, what can we do on these resources? We can read them, and reading them means retrieving one representation of the resource. We do an HTTP GET asking for a representation. GET uh, slash students give me the full list of all the students in some concrete representation. A text file, for example. How? Of course, in the body of the HTTP response. So the HTTP response will contain not the HTML file of a web page, but the representation of that resource. In the case of a collection, a get gives me the list of all the possible items. In some cases, for performance reasons, it will not give me all the list, but only the first 100 or first 20 or first whatever, and then I have, I have a mechanism for getting the next ones. But just for avoiding... Re um, passing around files that are too big. If I get, if I use the get method on an uh, individual element, for example, this student, if I try to do a get here, what I will receive will be the representation of the student. So all the properties of that student, that could be the enrollment number, name, last name, uh, the course of study, and uh, the date of birth or whatever information we have about that single item of a student. Hmm? Get. Post is the verb. So we are just uh, reinterpreting the verbs, the methods in HTTP in terms of resources and not in terms of web pages. So we are using the mechanism that is already there in HTTP. Post 
create creates a new resource and usually is the method for adding a new element into a collection i post to a collection by sending and the post method has a payload there's a body with it and the body describes the element that they want to add to the collection so if i want to add a new student i will post a message to the uri uh, slash students with a description of the information of the state of the new student i'm going to upload to say so it's a way of creating new elements put uh, on the other way is usually used for updating existing elements so i can do a put to a student not to a collection i put to an element by and i i will update the information about that element so post means create put means uh, usually update i say usually because then every developer of, uh, of every interface may have different choices in some case delete well we don't discuss about delete too much because we don't like deleting stuff but you can imagine that delete uh, on an item deletes all information about that item delete on a collection deletes all the elements of that collection so this is a, an example of another of the the general picture i can have a resource talking about a collection of dogs and a resource describing one specific dog and they can post to the collection to create a new dog and usually it makes no sense to post to a to a single dog hmm? a dog is in a collection you cannot create anything inside the dog on the collection gives you the list of all the dogs and get on the element gives you information about that specific dog put on the single dog will update information and if this dog this URI doesn't exist well it's an error usually you cannot update something if it doesn't exist uh, you could uh, in some cases but it's not very used uh, update a collection in blocks but if, if you upload a lot uh, a lot of elements but it's very the semantics of this is not very clear so it's not not very often used and delete of course this all of them or just one just to clarify post creates a new dog and put updates a dog that is already existing so creating is an operation of the collection level updating is a collection is an operation of the element level okay uh, these four elements and collections there is more usually in a conceptual representation of elements elements can have relationships to each other for example a student is enrolled in one or more courses or a course is composed of one or 20 or 30 or 50 or more students so how to represent the, not all the students, uh, but the students uh, that are enrolled in that specific course. So what we do, a way to represent that is to identify first uh, the course and then say about this course, what are the students inside, let's say, that course. So relationships usually have, are represented in this way. The entity that we are starting from slash the relationship towards we want to have information so in this case you see that the URI ends with a noun so it represents a collection the collection of all the courses that are related associated in relationship with this student and on the other so it will be a list of courses not all the courses but only the ones that are related to this guy on the other hand uh, this will be a list of students that are associated with this specific course usually the guidelines tell try to go no deeper than this don't construct very complex URI because at the point you will have a collection if you want something about that students you will have another URI that starts with students slash something else 
try not to nest, to make every resource independent so that you have a sort of a canonical representation of every type of information. These are just like guidelines, of course. But so like this, we, we can represent as you arise a sort of a conceptual model of the information that we have. And this can be represented, of course, in uh, concrete formats, must be represented in concrete formats. And these representations are downloaded when you do a get or uploaded when you do a post or a put. The get uh, is an HTTP operation that has uh, a body in the response message. The put and post have a body in the request message and don't have a response. Okay, so sending or receiving. In both cases, uh, we send put post or receive get information in some specific format. And usually the main format that are being used are XML and JSON. I spend a, a few words about JSON later. And, uh, um, or maybe also other formats as possible. In some cases, you can choose the representation in which you want to interact. So I can tell you, give me the information about this student in XML format or in JSON format, or give me a picture give me information about these students in JPEG format. So the resource is the same, the student. The representation I want from that resource can be different. So there is often, not always, often a way to specify when I request some information in which format I want uh, the representation to be returned. And how to represent this format, there are different ways. In some cases, use a, a, a header in the request. Say, OK, if I do a get, for example, I use the accept header in the HTTP request by saying, I want back this format. And so the server knows that they will accept a response in this format and will generate, hopefully, a response in that format. Or another way is to append an extension. You know that this is not a file, it's just a, a name for a resource. But we can have the convention that you just append .json if you want a, re a response in JSON format. You append .x .jpg if you want a response in JPEG format. Some servers use that. It's not very clean in my opinion, but they use that. Because it gives a special meaning to the dot which is not encoded in the URI. The URIs don't, don't give special meanings to dots. That's a character. But uh, another way is to use a parameter. Uh, so we want the, this resource, uh, question mark format equal JSON. The, and they pass a parameter to the request to the URI by specifying additional information about what kind of request they want. So some attributes of the request that I give explicitly. You find all of the three when you try to look at how people offer API uh, interfaces. And uh, these uh, APIs are very, very used in the, and really uh, used in, in many, many services. Uh, for example, this is a very famous, one of the first to publish them. Uh, Flickr is a, uh, is a sort of representation that uh, gives you a rise for downloading images. And uh, if you change the extension of your request, uh, you will get a representation of the same image, the image is the resource in this case, in different formats. Or I like uh, maybe to have a look with you at this uh, Twitter API, just to understand uh, how these concepts map uh, to real life uh, connection problems. It worked uh, at the beginning of the class. Some of you is jamming my network. Do you have any jammer in your pocket? So. Connecting and uh,
okay let's go forward and we'll come back when the network will be more friendly with us um, okay uh, so this was for the, the basic uh, uh, resources and the basic way of uh, ways of retrieving or sending resources if you want to do some more complex uh, query for example uh, the, you use the mechanism of uh, query parameters so if you want to filter results uh, with some criteria by date uh, by name uh, by owner or whatever or by type uh, you can it depends on the of course the, the interface that they offer just having URIs is uh, a way of representing abstract resources but uh, if we want to filter them down uh, uh, you need to specify what are the criteria so what are the the the, um, the attributes that you want to bind uh, to a specific uh, value hmm? in this case for example it can give me an, a maximum number of results to give back uh, and uh, user timeline gives me all the posts uh, and they can um, say uh, restrict this list of all the posts to just the posts from this specific user username hmm? Twitter username um, okay this is when everything goes okay when something goes wrong what happens okay we are in the HTTP protocol HTTP has already some 30 different status code messages already defined so when something goes wrong uh, we try to return a meaningful HTTP status code so it could be a 400 and something error 404 416 415 or whatever depends on the type of error just to give to the client information that this request could not be satisfied for some reason and uh, usually in the body of the response so usually when you get when you send back an error we'll ju you just send back the, the header this good user of sending also with an error message a body with the encoding of some uh, more detailed description about the reason why the error occurred because if you find a 404 error then it's a pay web page that doesn't exist if you are navigating the web but in this case uh, you are getting a resource uh, what does it mean that it doesn't exist I don't have the permission uh, did I make some syntax error or whatever hmm? so usually we try to be more to give more explain, explanations in the body of the response these are suggestions okay, a good practice and uh, another issue that we ju I'm just touching here is uh, the issue of uh, limiting the access of the to this API uh, when you can get the list of all the students with a URI like this uh, you should wonder okay do I want everybody in the world to be able to access this information or do I want to limit it uh, usually if you are say working interactively with some application for limiting the users uh, you need to enforce a sort of a login the users must log in so must get a cookie that allows them to continue to navigate in the session REST does not use cookies, it only uses single requests. So there must be a way of uh, embedding into the specific request, imagine a GET, some information by which the user requesting is uh, authorized in some way to do the request. If I want uh, some request only to be, let's say, uh, allowed to uh, authorize the users. And so there are different ways of doing that. Uh, one way is using uh, the, um, the so-called uh, HTML basic authentication. So it's uh, something very simple that adds uh, a HTTP header in the request with a code, with a hash code of, the, of a password. So if you can get this, if you send me the right password, I will let you in. If you don't send me the right password, you will not be allowed. This is very weak. This is very weak because everybody that, that copies this one is able to 
uh, access this API in my, uh, impersonate my, um, my identity. There are some, uh, and this is used, for example, by, by the Twitter streaming API, which has been deprecated. Uh, there are other uh, more complex mechanisms uh, with uh, usernames, hash, and passwords, uh, and uh, mm, say ways of uh, generating hash, which is, cannot be replayed identically. It needs to be generated differently every way, every time. So you have a special generation or connection authentication session, and then you can have this key to use in the following request. Uh, today, most of the websites and most of the uh, services tend to use uh, the more complex uh, OAuth open authentication method, OAuth2, which is quite complex at the beginning, but then there are a lot of libraries that are able to handle that. And since a lot of services are tending to use this mechanism, it's becoming more and more easy to use and more and more, say, popular. So if you think about authentication, usually instead of trying to invent your own mechanism that will be flawed by some security way, of course, because if you invent that, you don't think uh, about all the possible issues, try to adopt uh, this. Uh, you will find that in many cases for accessing popular services, you already have the libraries for doing that. If you want to offer ser services, you have to there's something to understand about the keys to exchange and encryption and so on, but it's quite, uh, say, extremely, uh, streamlined. It's, mm, uh, in, for us, in our lab experiments, uh, it will be easier because uh, uh, we will be inside a protected network, so there will not be uh, anybody from uh, the outside of the Polytechnic that can access uh, our servers and so on. So we will have a protection at the network level, so we don't care so much about uh, authorization but in general it's an issue to to keep in mind uh, when you are offering your lives okay so this is the let's see if uh, no eh? if you are luckier now uh, yes Don't breathe. Okay. So this is an example about the, the API offered by, by Twitter. It's an uh, REST API. It's written in very big letters at the beginning. And it, it groups uh, resources into different concepts. There's the concept of a timeline a sequence of tweets, there's the concept of a tweet, there is something about search, which is not actually a resource, but the way to, to, to do search in the same interface, something about streaming, so having a real-time update of the post, direct messages, friends and followers, users in general, user profiles, suggested users, favorites, every action you can do through the website of Twitter or to a mobile application of Twitter, you can also do the same thing about this uh, API, which is quite long, of course, because there are a lot of, of issues. For example, if you want to uh, get information about a user, You have uh, account slash settings. You have uh, the first uh, resource that is called account. Account slash, account slash, account slash. So users, information about users is embedded inside a resource that is called account. And then settings give me all the information about the co current user. But you can also have, uh, uh, and you see it's a get. Get information about the current user. And then you can have uh, update profile. A uh, date profile sets the values that users are able, are able to set. So you can change your information with a call. And this, in this case, it's a post. It should be a put, but they use post. Okay, mm. they are not perfect. Um, and, for example, and if we go to tweets, uh, tweets, uh, you have... Uh, 
they call it them statuses. So a tweet uh, is uh, something that is represented by the resource statuses. And you can get uh, a, a specific uh, tweet if you have your its uh, ID, a retweet, uh, the, sorry, the, the list of all the tweets, uh, the retweets uh, or a given tweet, or the information about one single tweet. For example, let's, let's give the, let's see the documentation about this. Getting the information about one tweet. Here, in the, with this syntax, they represent a, a placeholder for the ID of that tweet. So if I have one ID of a tweet, this is the information that is uh, in the list, what I can get, this is the resource, and this is the, an example of what you get back, all the information that you get back from this resource. This is all information from a single tweet that is returned back if you query this URI with the get method. So you actually you have a lot of information behind all the information behind that specific tweet with a get. If you want to post a new tweet, you have this post statuses update. The post, I'm creating something, what uh, an update of my status. The status is the list of my tweets. So in this case, uh, let's go to the example. I will post to update. And I will add some post data. Post data will uh, the body of the request, of the HTTP request. And so the tweet is added, and it will be give, get, uh, give me back a representation of the tweet that I just sent with all the information associated to it, in particular the ID of that tweet, that I can use to track it afterwards. See if somebody is favoriting or somebody is retweeting and so on. So you just, uh, if you are used to using uh, Twitter, for example, you can seek uh, what, what are the APIs for doing every single action that you are used to, to do, uploading images and so on. It's not, uh, you cannot write uh, immediately, interactively, because every request must be authenticated in some way. So if you see, if you want to know how to do that, you need to create an application key that is the code that we send in every request. And uh, if you want to play with that, you said that the authentication requires user context. And this user context is explained. Uh, if you click here, you have all the information about uh, the authentication methods uh, and the documentation here about the OAuth, the uh, authorization. You can sign in with your account and it will give you they call it a user key or an application key to use for doing your, your uh, say, interaction. Hmm? So it, it requires a little setup in order to get the key that enables you to do the request. But after that, all, all functions of the website are available there with a simple API. Hmm? Okay. Um, so this is just a summary about how to think about uh, uh, the rest uh, organization of the interfaces. I mentioned several times uh, here, and we also saw that very briefly in the examples, the JSON format. Is anybody already familiar with JSON? Very few. So we just spent some uh, uh, collection with one element, very few. Um, we uh, spent just a couple of words uh, about JSON. JSON is a strange name that stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's a way, it was born as a way to serialize objects in the JavaScript language. A way to represent in textual form the value of an object in JavaScript. JavaScript is an object-oriented language, and so it's a, it has a way to, to serialize and deserialize objects. But then that syntax that was born in JavaScript was so easy to use and to parse and to create that became the standard. Compared to XML, which is very lengthy with all the tags and open and close and need to balance and so on, 
and the commas and uh, uh, lots of syntax issues and so it requires more character to send and receive and more power to uh, encode and to parse more computing power and more time so json is very light as a representation it's a very simple representation which says that every complex data structure so imagine a very complex object or nested object with collections and so on so imagine what you are doing in any course of object-oriented programming you have collections of, of objects with, that have properties of different types and some of these properties refer to other objects and some objects are collections and so on a very complex issue json brings it down to two primitives says you can construct your object using only two primitives the object and the array an object also called a dictionary also called a, re a record or a structure represents a set of uh, name value name value name value pairs so uh, an object will say okay uh, i have seven properties is properties an, as a name and that property is a specific value and objects are represented with braces curly braces the other way of uh, putting together information is uh, lists or arrays so a list of arrays that are indexed by numbers instead of the collections that are indexed uh, by property name so in a, in a collection there's no is an, in an object uh, you have different uh, fields the different properties each of them has a specific name in a list or an array you have many items and they are identified by the number the first the second the third the fourth zero one two three four that's it so you can represent uh, a person like this curly brace object it's an object with a property first name value John comma property last name value Smith property address value it's an object property phone numbers value it's a list or an array if we go inside the nesting this object has a property street address with this address a property city New York, a property state, a property postal code. This array has two elements, zero and one. The zero element is this, now, this string, and the one element is this other string. You, you don't need to define any data type, any classes, any, it's not type. Uh, it's, you can only have uh, object, arrays, you can nest objects into arrays, objects into objects, arrays into objects, however you want. And uh, you then at the bottom level, you have only two data types that are strings and numbers. That's it. So it's very, very simple. Of course, you need to be careful because you, you need to know what is the structure of this element. But if the structure is known, the representation, you know what kind of representation you have, then it will be very simple to generate and very simple to read this kind of format. And very compact, by the way, compared to the same information if you try to encode that in XML. So this, in fact, uh, is the full syntax of JSON. The full syntax tree. Say that, okay, any object is represented by braces, open brace close brace and in between there can be nothing or can be a couple name value the name is a string a value can be anything how to construct arrays square brackets and between square brackets you may have nothing or one value one single value without the name and uh, these elements can be repeated you see that here you can have a loop uh, repeated by separating them with commas very simple a value 
that you can find here and here, a value can be a string, a number, or an object, or an array. So an object can contain a value, and this value can be another object. And then can contain a second value, and the second value can be an array, and so on. And uh, an array contains some value, and these values can be objects or can be other arrays that are nested inside each other. So the, the power, of course, comes from the nesting of many levels. But each level is very simple. And then you have some syntax for writing numbers and some syntax for writing strings. But uh, that's it. So it's very easy to, to read this format because it has very uh, simple rules. Uh, and so you can, you can see that you can construct information like this. And this is a format which is used very, very much in the REST uh, interfaces, in the REST APIs. Hmm? So why are we discussing REST uh, in uh, so much detail? Well, because uh, many of our intelligent devices can have uh, a REST interface. For example, the Philips lights, uh, the U lights, uh, have uh, a REST uh, the controller it uh, gives you a REST access. And uh, so it's a, it's a way not just of interacting or integrating with Twitter or with Google Maps or with, uh, with other online services, but in many cases also to interact with embedded devices. So it's becoming a sort of universal integration mechanism, very light, so it doesn't really consume, ban con consume much bandwidth, and it doesn't uh, uh, require many computational resources. So, one specific w uh, reason why we use, uh, uh, we want to discuss REST uh, is that it's the, the protocol that is also offered by the DOG gateway, DOG or DOG gateway, which is uh, the software that have, we have been developing in our in, uh, in Polytechnico for doing management of uh, intelligent systems. It's a gateway. And if you remember, so I will give you some information very briefly about what this dog is a black box, uh, and see, and then give a bit more detail about the API that you can use, you can use for using dog to control the environment. If you don't want to control to say, to interface directly with the devices. So if you you will remember these three first slides, at the beginning of the course we said. There's a jungle out there. There are a lot of many different devices, and each device or each family or each manufacturer chooses some protocols on top of some others. So it's very difficult to build a complete intelligent environment by pulling together devices coming from different sources. And what we need at that point to design something say, complex, complex and intelligent, is to separate all the application levels from all the network issues by using a neutral representation that just describes these devices in an abstract way. So this is what uh, the dog gateway is trying to do. Dog gateway is a software that will run on a PC-like uh, uh, say platform like the Raspberry Pi, for example, so it can run on low, uh, say, power um, so, um, platforms. And on one hand, uh, the gateway can control devices of different technologies and appliances, for example, the lights and so on, with different protocols. So it's able to interface it has the knowledge to speak with the different devices but from the top level dog as an api which is uh, neutral independent from the technology and allows me to create some applications some user interfaces some intelligent uh, uh, application and so on that just uses the dog api and then dog will need to do the hard work uh, of matching the high level command uh, into the specific protocol level packets or requests or whatever. Mm. So it's an integration component, which is programmable and is able to abstract. Um, so 
basically it gives you a single point of access to your intelligent environment uh, even if this environment is composed of different technologies and uh, you can learn a single api rest uh, to program your environment uh, by having doc to translate uh, and to do the work for you and uh, and of course then you can develop and extend it because it's, uh, it's open, it's modular architecture, but I don't want to go into details on how it's built. Let's try to just use it as a black box as you, as you will use it in the lab. So actually, we have this, uh, applied this information hiding concept uh, in which we have all the information about the networks, the protocol, the devices, that is constantly changing. Every week, a new device is coming out uh, and uh, maybe it's using some already existing protocol, but in a different way no? we find it everywhere every time we get a new device there will always something new to learn there always some new quirk or mechanism about the network integration of these devices so but we want to hide this to the programmers and to offer to the programmers just a simple api which just uh, is slowly evolving so it doesn't change too much try to hide all the details of the network by offering a high-level interface, which is abstract and mainly, mostly, I say, constant or stable, and is the same independently from the strange things about the low-level technology. So this is a hard work that the, the dog gateway is trying to do. The concept behind that, behind, behind this uh, API, the main concept is try to model the devices from what they do and not from what they are. These devices are different, are different objects, but they do the same thing. They do the job of a lamp. And the job of a lamp is to be turned on or off. You may have different types of lamps, collect, connected the LED lamps, connected the wireless wires in many different ways. But if they are lamps, they all do the same job. They accept a command on, they accept a command off, and they will hopefully execute that command. So the, the API will describe a device that is called lamp and give the command on and, or, and off to be applied to that device. And uh, all of these devices are all different. They're all different. Some are the B, some are, this is power line, some are um, Z-Wave in, in this example, just in this picture. But they all, they, some are pluggable, some are just to be installed into the, directly into the, into the fixtures or into the walls. But they all do the same job. They are a combination of an energy meter and a plug. And uh, what do they do? They all do the same job. As a plug, they can be turned on and off. They can connect or disconnect the plug, programmatically, remotely. And as a meter, they can, they can give you information about the energy consumed and the power which is being consumed instantaneously by that specific plug. So the programmer of the MEI system just has to know that um, a plug has this functionality and the meter has this functionality. Then, of course, it's the job of the gateway to configure that specific plug uh, with the ZB protocol, uh, command class, uh, blah, 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 to be configured and recognized and controlled by the gateway. That is what we, we, are, we are able in, the, in this course to start developing a, a intelligent ambience and only later in the last uh, three, three weeks of the course, we will give you some more details about the specific protocol, the Connex and the Bitticino and Zigbee and Z-Wave. We can develop without knowing them because we have an instruction level to reason about. Hmm? Uh, so, for example, what uh, the gateway does is to model the command. Uh, this lamp uh, is a lamp, and, and a lamp has a command off, 
and maybe this command is uh, encoded in this way this is a specific for my real protocol for the my open protocol and if you give the command off then the gateway uh, at the, na the natural modeling will model a lamp with a command and the gate will, will translate that to a network sequence of bytes and the same for the on command a lamp will also have an on command which will be rep represented in, the, in in a different way but if this lamp will be a convex lamp instead of a myopen lamp uh, the representation will, here will be totally different but the model will be the same so a device from the high level point of view is just a set of uh, three information groups what functionality has the device what functionality means uh, what comments I can give what can it do in what states it can be a lamp is simple a lamp can be on can be switched on or can be switched off can be in the state on and the state off and you accept it accept two commands go on and go off okay. it's a very simple it's a case in which the commands match the states but in more complex uh, settings for example imagine an automatic door a door can be closed open state in which state can be a door opening closing in between but not moving so the, it has many different states and it may have different commands common may be open and an open common will move the, word, the, the door from closed to opening to open change different states a long time or another common will be closed and they activate a sequence of states so in more complex devices there is not a direct matching between the commands that the device can receive and the states imagine a dishwasher or a washing machine it's a, it, it has basically a command go but then there's a lot of cycle internal states to go through hmm? so what are the internal states of the system that are visible to the gateway so maybe the system has internal states that are hidden and you cannot know them but uh, some other are explicit what are the command it can get and what are the notification it will give me so notification is an information a set of information that the device will give me spontaneously for example usually a thermostat in a room will send me the current temperature every five minutes so i model that as a notification what the device is talking about what are the, the communication that is start by the device so every device uh, and we have a lot of device modeled uh, in dog for example this is just uh, this is not very uh, updated so we have more than twice as much we took time to generate the picture so we didn't update it so we have many different types of device every device is modeled by describing these three and with these three sets of information you can build your own application it's all you know all you need to know to use the device not to program it not to configure it you need to do it by hand but once it's configured to use the device you just need to know this and this is independent from the technology I say it again so for example if I have a switch and a lamp the abstract model is something like this a lamp is a device that has a one couple of states on and off and it's grouped in some conceptual entity that is called the on off state and the on off state is a property of all the objects that can be on and off and it's composed of two specific state values on state and off state and also switch has the same type of state and uh, the lamp can have a, a functionality of being turned on and being turned off the command it can receive so i can tell a lamp go off so uh, using the off com sending the off command to the lamp a switch uh, has a different uh, functionality it has the same state but there's a different functionality i cannot command the switch uh, go on the switch is in, is in a position it's the user that can move it who can move it but the switch can tell me 
what is the action of the user. So it gives me a notification saying, okay, somebody turns me on or somebody turned me off. Hmm? So it's at a different set of functionality. This is a non-off functionality, and this is a non-off not on off notification functionality. The functionality of notifying me whether somebody turned me on or off. And then the intelligent environment could intelligently think that if somebody turned on the switch, uh, then you should send the lamp a command on, for example, if you want, if the context uh, allows. So this is the kind of modeling you will see by using the dog uh, gateway. Uh, this is uh, an example of a structure, how this is, st is structured in XML. We'll see it uh, interactively. Uh, by saying that it's a, you have a device with some information about the device uh, and the, the device has some functionality, control functionality, notification functionality, state, uh, and you see inside this control functionality you have uh, the off command and so on. So this uh, general model is uh, adopted by the dog gateway that especially as this uh, API that we are going to learn. DOG is based, uh, we'll just give you a picture, on uh, four different layers. The bottom layer is drivers, so a set of classes, it's all written in Java. Uh, a set of drivers that are able to interact with the different technologies. There are many drivers for each of the technologies. Core functions just to manage all the abstract model, the model of the devices and the list of instances, and to exchange messages between the different modules, and the API for communicating with the outside world. Plus some add-on modules that you can add and program inside if you want the gateway to do some services by itself. And this is just a simplified view of the classes of the libraries that we have, and on the bottom line you see all the different technologies that, su that are supported, but the information about the technology does not go up this line. It stops here. From this point up, uh, everything is general, is abstract, thanks to the natural modeling that we talked about. Okay, let's talk about uh, um, the interface. Uh, we had, uh, if the network is working, in our lab uh, on Luigi's desk, uh, there is a small uh, uh, Raspberry Pi with an instance of dog running. And so I'm connecting to this, uh, it is a very, very simple administration interface. So it's something for <laughs> just checking that everything is running. Just to see the, the, the model that uh, this uh, gateway, this, you, here you have some information about the gateway which is running, uh, the system memory and something like that. The components uh, is the list uh, of the modules of the gateway itself. It should be always uh, all, gr all green, otherwise something is wrong with the Java framework, but the user is, doesn't care about this. And in this case, uh, this gateway is configured with six devices. There are six devices connected to this instance of dog, and for each device you see a rendering of the information that we have about this device. This is the name meter in power outlet three, the name of the device, of type meter in power outlet. So we have, there are plugs, meter in plugs. Hmm? One, they are all plugs, uh, smart plugs and Z-Wave in this case. There is a temperature and humidity sensor and there's the gateway that, takes, uh, uh, that connects all of them together. And we have the name of the device, the type of the device, the location, they are all in lab six. And then we have the representation of the state. A meter and power outlet has a state made of three components. Status can be on or off. Single phase active energy, single phase active power. So it's the power and energy. And these are single phase meters and they only measure active energy and power. So very simple as network analysis. So this, meet, uh, this say, say that currently this plug is on, so it delivers power, but nothing is connected. It's not consuming at this time. But uh, 
on his life, it consumed uh, 2,000 kilowatt hours in total. And uh, is there echo? This one is uh, consuming something. It's on and it's consuming 37 watts. This is the monitor display of Luigi's computer. So it just ask me, just play with this, but don't turn off uh, the power, the plug number five. Otherwise, my monitor will go. And it's, it's running consuming 37 watts. This information is not known to this interface. It's uh, extracted from the REST API information. And off and on are the set of comments that are available for this type of device. So this type of all the type of meter into power outlet, they have the same states. They have different values, of course, for the states. The same states and the same comments. Is this uh, plug on? I can turn it off. Click off. I'm sending this off. We'll send uh, a request through the web API to the REST API to the gateway. The gateway will translate it into a command into the Z-Wave network. The Z-Wave network will reply with a notification that the plug is turned off. This notification is propagated up to the interface, and you see that it's now it's, it's, it should be off. It goes off here. And if I turn it on again, it should, it should. Okay, on. It takes some delay because maybe the, the, the plug is open immediately, but it takes time for the plug, since it's on a wire, wireless uh, network, to give the notification back. Okay, let's turn it on. Um, this is a very simple administration interface. Hmm? On, off. I think somebody is also pressing the buttons there. Um, the idea, just imagine that if we are controlling a smart home like this, or a smart environment like this, we are never sure that we are the only control point of this device. A user can be pressing the button, or some other interface is trying to send commands to the same devices. So it's important to think that you are not uh, you know, the, the, the master of the device and you can control everything. You can control individual devices, but this, the same devices can be also controlled by other people at the same time. So you can see something changing, and you don't know why, because somebody else is trying to use. If some of you copy this address, Maybe they're trying to, to play trick on, tricks on me. Hmm? Um, it will not work tomorrow. Huh? You just uh, open the door for this class. Of course, uh, this is the administration interface that is accessible to dog and the, on this port and with this address. So when in the lab you will have instances of dog, uh, you can use this address to go to this interface to check what's happening uh, inter and interact with the devices. But if you want to program it, you can use yourself the REST API. So DOG offers uh, a REST API, which is hosted at the port 8080 slash API slash version one. And inside this, you have uh, a set of uh, APIs that are summarized uh, in this document online, at this address. And see that you have API for devices, for the status of the devices, and for, send, so for querying the state of the devices, and for sending commands to devices. Then you have other groups of API for the environment uh, and for, uh, for a simple rule uh, engine that is embedded in some versions of, of DOG itself. So basically, the principles of REST and JSON are applied here. You may have a device API that can get, query the gateway about which devices are installed, where they are, how they are configured, what is their status, or the measure. The status can be on, off, or a kilowatt hour measure, and so on. Or execute comments on, the, on devices. These the, are the main uh, uh, points. So let's try. To, uh, to interact with that. So the easiest, the first point 
in interacting with the gateway is knowing what devices are there. So I'm using a, a very simple, in this case, it's, a, it's a, an extension, uh, it's a browser extension. It's called the REST client, just to help me compose the HTTP requests uh, instead of writing a program. So the API tells me that to, to get the list of all the devices, these are hidden or they are represented or are mapped to the resource slash devices. So slash devices is a resource that represents all the domotic devices are handled by dot. And the method that is supported is only get in this case. Hmm? Get uh, the list of devices. Give me the list of all devices. So if I want to do that, I can, sorry, send the address of the, sorry, the address of the dog instance, slash API, slash version one, this is constant, slash devices. I send a get request, and if I send a request, I will get a response by the gateway. So I sent a get to this resource. A resource is a collection in this case, it's a resource type collection, so the get will give me the list. The response is made of some headers and a body. In this case, for this specific request, uh, I can ask the body to be formatted, to be represented in JSON or in XML form. In this case, uh, I had some by means of some header, the accept header is used for selecting. In this case, I said uh, application slash JSON, and it gave me the response in JSON. Brace, brackets, and so on. This is more readable, I think, uh, in the XML format, so I will change the header. I'm just changing the way I'm composing the get request. Get this URI, the headers of the request. This is just a very simple interface for, for using that. I change this, I send the request again, and I get the same response in XML form. And this uh, gives me uh, some information, let's see like this, about what is in the house, what is in the house, in the configured under this gateway. So you have all the devices and trying to collapse the XML to understand something. You have the gateway, temperature sensor, sensor and one to four, four meter in power outlet. The same that we saw in the interface, of course. We were playing with number three. Let's see where is number three. It's this one. What information do we have about number three? Well, if I pass the XML, I have all the information. Let me collapse something. I have all the information about what the device called uh, uh, meter empowered outlet Lee 3 can do. Meter empowered outlet 3 is a new device, is in Lab 6, and it has uh, three control functionalities. So three groups of comments I can send, three notification functionalities, so three sets of information that it will, it will send me back to me, and three groups of states. So it is the state that is made of three independent sets of values. The states are on-off, which is common to all uh, plugs, uh, can be off state or on state. The state can be the, the single phase active power measurement states, uh, so it's a, the state is a, it's a set, it's a, in this case, a, a set of real numbers that represent the current power, and another set of real numbers that represent, oops, represent the, um, ah. why do you hate me? Okay. Meet the power rather three. 
and the other represents the, the energy. And then the commands, how, we, how can we turn it on or off? We have the on-off functionality that contains the on command and the off command. From uh, reading this information that we get with, that we have with one single request, uh, we have the list of devices and the list of commands on, off, that each of these devices can accept. And we have the state, uh, as we said, of the device. So how can we read the state, the current, because this is just a representation of the device, the model of the device. Then I want to know, now, is this plug on or off? I can go to the status part of the API. And in particular, we have uh, one request. Sorry. That can ask you the status of all devices, devices slash status, or the status of a single device. In this, guy, in this case, it's a resource inside the device's main resource. So device, this lamp, status. So what I can do now is say, let's concentrate on this plug number three. I want to know everything about this plug. For example, I want to know the information about uh, this plug only. So I could do a get not of all, let's go back, of all devices, but I want information only about this meter in parallel outlet three. I use auto-completion to avoid uh, doing typing mistakes. So it's I get a response with that only represents uh, this specific uh, device. It's the same information as before. But this is the static information. This is the description of the device. But what is this device doing uh, now? Slash status. Uh, in this case, I need to change the format. Okay, because you see the documentation that the get of the status, I lost it. Device ID status only accept JSON as the response format. So it's a, not all the methods can be combined with all, all the formats and so on because it's, it's an implementation issue. Okay, conceptually you could do everything, but then it depends on what is implemented by that specific uh, uh, node. Sorry. And uh, here. And so in this case, I asked. Uh, Devices, meter in power outlet, represent the resource of that specific plug. The status is the current value of the status of the device. And it tells me that, okay, this is the meter in power outlet 3. It's currently active. Active means active on, on the, connected to the gateway and to the network. And what, what is its current status? The status of the resource. Well, it has three different status domains, three sets of states. Uh, the first, the energy, power, and on-off. The energy is 2,000 kilowatt hour. Uh, the power is zero watt, uh, and the state is currently off. And if we want to turn it on, if we want to turn it on, let's go back to the API. We see, look under comments. Sending comments is easy because it just revise devices, device ID. So the set of all devices, the single device, slash comments, the set of all possible comments, slash name of the command. And the name of the command uh, was on or off. We saw that in the, in the, in the XML of the device. And so we can put, uh, because we are, we are updating a device by sending a new command. 
put also post works but it's being deprecated uh, we want to support only put in the future so i want to this was uh, off i want to turn it on so let's go there let's use uh, meter bound outlet command so the resource commands of the device should be set uh, what was it off should be set on I want to send the on command. Wait, I don't use get for sending a comment, I use put. So I need to change the HTTP method. If I do my send, there is no response, but in the header it said 204. No content, I don't have any information to give you back, but 200 means okay. And if I want to know whether it's really okay, I try to get the status of the device again and hopefully it's now on so it works hmm? so get devices give me all the information about any devices actually we have a list of devices and for each device the list of state that device can give me and the list of commands that device will accept for getting information about the states I just do a get on the de devices device ID slash status for sending command I just put onto the device device ID command slash command name and the name of the command I don't need to know it beforehand uh, because it's already written in the configuration of the device that they get at the beginning so with very little prior information an application can discover a list of devices discover the comments and offer the user the possibility of sending these comments and uh, querying these devices so it's actually a very the api is more complex it has more methods but the main ones are just one for querying which are the devices what is the current status and uh, uh, change send comments to change the state and this is, you see this, they are very simple and they are based on the once you we understand the rest addressing uh, it becomes very natural to compose the, these uris and to understand what method to apply mm -hmm. and just uh, uh, to understand we we reason about the uris uh, and of course we must have a good uh, documentation about this api first we uh, we saw together the the twitter API documentation which is quite rich with a lot of examples this is not so rich but tries to be as precise and complete as we need it okay so uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, cl uh, classes today and next week uh, you will start using rest uh, for integrating uh, in python for integrating devices for doing nice games uh, and tricks uh, and uh, in the future we will use it also to control the environment uh, either directly if the, some device is supporting JSON uh, or REST uh, not natively, or through some middleware gateway like DOG uh, with this uh, API interface. Okay, that's all for now. Just have a break. Thank you.